today we're going to look at my basic Lightroom editing workflow for landscape photography. So I really haven't done an editing video on this channel before and I've been putting it off because I really hadn't felt super comfortable with my workflow or what I'm, how I'm editing and, and things like that. I tend to change things a lot. One style draws me one time, another style draws me another. But I think I'm starting to come to realize that really editing workflows just change over time. And no matter how long I keep doing this, my my sense of style, my sense of what I want is different, coupled with as my knowledge of tools increases and gets more in depth, my workflows change. So rather than keep putting off doing a editing video, I thought we'd dive in a day and we'd do one on my basic Lightroom editing workflow for landscape photography. So this is going to focus on the Lightroom side of things. I feel like Lightroom's where a lot of new photographers get started because with the sliders and stuff, it just seems easier than Photoshop. Photoshop landscape photography editing is super powerful and you can do some amazing things there but I feel like for a lot of new landscape photographers Lightroom is sort of where you get your start at so we're going to sort of go through my basic workflow this process I would say gets me to the 80 85 percent mark on a lot of my photos and in some cases it'll take it all the way other times I need to jump into Photoshop and do some things and I'll touch on a couple of things I might do in Photoshop that I don't always do in Lightroom but this should get you a very good start on your editing your raw landscape photography images so this is based on the most recent version of Lightroom Classic and uh, let's dive in there. The image we're going to work with today, this is an image I took at Ash Cave, which is in Hocking Hills, Ohio. It's one of my frequently visited places. You've seen lots of my videos from there. I'm lucky. I only live about an hour from there, and there's a tremendous number of just forest scenes, hemlocks, gorges, waterfalls. It's just a, 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 an amazing place to go photograph, and I'm lucky to live so close to it. But this particular image is from late February. It is of a region called Ash Cave, and it was very high flow that day. It was, it was after some snow melt and some rain. It, you know, the falls were running really good that day. And what I've got pulled up here is, on the left here, I've got my unedited raw file from a Nikon uh, Z6 II, and it was shot with my uh, 24 to 70 f4 lens. I got the info up on the screen here, and we were sitting at 27 millimeters, uh, so a fairly wide angle, and shutter speed of 1.6 seconds at f11 and ISO 100. One of the first things I like to do when I sit down and look at a image is sort of figure out what direction do I want to go with it. And in this case, in order to keep the highlights, and you can see up here, I even pulled some of those highlights. They're blown a little bit. I've got Lightroom set to, you know, show highlights that are, you know, getting overexposed. And so over here, we can see with the white triangle, my highlights are, you know, right up against that edge. And I've got the highlight problems up in here in the sky. You know, I was using a histogram to shoot this to keep those highlights within control. But because of that, I got some darker areas here in the foreground. Falls is lit really nice, but I've sort of got this balance of darkness through here in this the sand floor of the cave and then the highlights up here. So that's one of the things I'm going to have to address. I sort of want to bring those into a slight more equal balance. Obviously, the sky is going to be a little brighter than the than shadowed cave, but it's a pretty big dynamic range at the moment. And then I sort of want to bring those falls into line. I got some pretty bright highlights up here, right where the water crests. I've talked about that, some of the difficulty in photographing waterfalls and how the light hits it is that's an area of highlights you really sort of have to watch. Not quite over on this. You can see I got one little blip right up there. So we'll need to correct that in there. So. Those are the things I'm looking at in this image. I want to get some of these shadows up so we can see sort of what's in this cave, bring some of those highlights down, make sure the focus is on that waterfall. Again, this is a raw image. I made a virtual copy over here. That's the one I'm going to work on and we'll go back and forth and we'll show before and after. I'm just going to walk through my basic steps. Uh, and this particular image will probably get me, oh, 90, 95% of the way where I want to be. I'm um, not 100% sure I would need to take this one into Photoshop. We shall see. Okay, so we're in here. I'm going to hit I to uh, for info to remove that section off the top of the screen so I can see the full image. If you ever want to get that back, just hit I again on the keyboard and it'll be there. So one of the first things I'm going to do here is I do this almost all my images, well, all my images for sure, is I go down to lens corrections and we're definitely going to remove chromatic aberration, which is right here. And that's where you've got sort of like a dark against the highlight. You can get some fringing on those edges where that, that contrast is. You'll get like a purplish fringing or something like that. In this particular case, there doesn't seem to be a lot of problems, but it never hurts to just click that remove chromatic aberrations and get that taken care of. So click that. I do enable profile corrections. What this will do is it'll consider what lens I have and it'll remove any lens vignetting, any kind of distortion that might be from the lens at the edges, either because it was super wide angle or anything like that. It'll just give it a little cleanup. Sometimes maybe you don't like that effect and you can turn enable lens correction back off. I would say 85% of the time or so I keep the enable lens correct 
directions enabled. In this particular case, it's using a built-in profile, which I can come down here to the eye, click on it, and we can see I shot this with a Nikon Z6 II. It uh, was done with the 2470 F4S, and that the raw file already had a built-in profile, so it is using that profile to, to make this correction. So I just click OK on there. So one of the next things I do is I sort of head down to calibration. This allows you to do some, some interesting things with your red, green, and blue. And what I've found over, over time and from watching other YouTube videos and how other people are editing their photos and things like this is this blue channel down here is pretty interestingly powerful. So if I take this and I, let's just swing it back to the left, makes it very unsaturated look across the whole image. Bring it this way though and look at that. It makes it so much brighter without, I mean, I didn't even really blow out my highlights anymore, but it still just brought a certain element of brightness to this image that just right out of the gate by moving that over to 100%, we're good. So let's take another look at that. Let's bring it back to zero. Here it is. And now let's swing that all the way to the right and just look at it pop like that. So very, very neat little trick. You know, there's several YouTube videos about it. I'll probably dive in and talk a little more in depth about exactly what this is doing. But over here, just sort of know, I pop down this calibration very early on in my process and just play with this. Some images it doesn't work and I won't mess with it or it'll be a minimal tweak or change. And this one, I think it works good. It gives me just a little bit of that brightness I was looking for out of it. I might back it off just a little bit down to like, oh, plus 85. Do a quick before and after. This is with it off. And boom, just that one change really makes a big difference in my opinion. So that's where I start. Now, that changed my blue saturation. And my water starts to start, started out looking what I thought was a little bluish, more blue than I like anyways. So because of that, just because I'm here and it's top of my head, I do go to the HSL section. I will usually grab the little dropper guy, come over onto some of the water. I'm gonna bring that down a little bit. And what that's doing is it's removing saturation, what essentially blue out of it. So it's helping turn that water back to white instead of what I think is a too artificially blue. That's sort of a style thing, a look. I like my water a little more towards the white side than the blue side, at least for waterfalls, when I've done the smoothing effect with it. So, you know, with a long exposure. We'll come back to the HSL slider just to play a bit, but because I just made that one saturation change, I sort of want to correct it before I move on to the rest, just because I know I'm going to anyways. Okay, so I've made my lens corrections. I've Played in the calibration panel, decided I did like the blue slider getting for saturation getting slid over to the right to near 100%. I think we settled on 80, 85. And then I made a slight correction in the HSL panel. So now we started to get back into the, the let's get back to the whole, whole part of the image here. So we go up to the basic panel. First thing I like to do is play a little bit with white balance. This was a 4750 as shot. Let's just throw an auto in just to see what it thinks. It actually cooled it down just a touch and I feel like it should have gone and warmed up just a touch. So we're gonna go ahead and just Crank this up just a little bit, give it a little bit more warmth. We're gonna settle in right around this 5400-ish or so. So I did warm it up a bit. To me, this particular area, again, sometimes you gotta think about how it makes you feel. And this area, the sand is always a reddish color. The walls are sort of a warmer color. The cave walls, in my opinion, there's a lot of oranges and yellows in them. You know, I want my trees to be a little warmer. It was February, so it obviously felt very, very cold. But I, the place still just a lot of times in my head it always has sort of a warmer feeling than a cold feeling for some reason. So that's the, the feeling I go towards. White balance to me is somewhat of a subjective. What did you feel? What did you want this to make you feel like? So if you like your images a little cooler, that's fine to cool them down and go with what you want. In this particular case, I feel like I like the warmer image or white balance. So we're going to kick that up a little bit. So from there, we swing to exposure, and with exposure, what we sort of want to do is, do, do I have details? And I do, so what we're, here's what we're looking for. So up here, you can see I'm clipping some of the blacks down here at um, normal exposure. You can see I'm clipping some of the blacks down here in the shadows. Not too bad, so if you think about the amount of dynamic range here from up here in the sky where I've got some highlights getting blown out, and down here to be able to capture this all in one camera just shows us how far cameras have come. So knowing I can correct some of this through shadows and highlights and uh, gradient filters and radio filters, just sort of want to see, do I have the data there if I want it? And yes, I can kick this exposure up, but I can get all my detail information out of here if I want. Now this is obviously way too bright. I'm really just trying to see, does my file have that information in it? Or do I need to be sensitive to the fact I might've lost some info and, and be careful in those areas. Likewise, I wanna bring it back to the left and underexpose. Do I have highlight detail? Yep, I can pull that back, bring my exposure down and up here, 
I'm not losing my highlights. Now it wasn't an interesting sky, but I didn't lose data up there, so I can work with that. So from there, if I hold shift down and double click on the little pointer there, Lightroom thinks I should bump the exposure by 0.82. I think it's airing a little bit on the bright side. This area up here in the sky gets a little too bright for me, so I'm gonna bring that exposure down just a touch for the moment. Get it in like right about there. That feels a little better to me. Now the sky is still a little bright and this is still a little dark, but as a base exposure, a global setting, I feel like this gets me to about where I wanna be. From here, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the highlights. Uh, I don't do a bunch with contrast just yet, and I don't do a large global contrast adjustment here anyways. But we're gonna skip down to the highlights section. And obviously watching these highlights up here in the sky is where my predominant piece Got a little teeny bump right here, which again, I always get concerned about the water coming over the cliff edges and waterfall pictures. Um, but yeah, so let's bring those highlights down a bit. And stop blowing my highlights, but just give me a little bit of liberty. I'm gonna bring those highlights down about negative 40. Now I'm gonna get some of these shadows out from the cave. Obviously it should be darker than you know the sky side, but let's get just a little bit more detail out of there. So we're gonna bump shadows up to like plus 20. Awesome. Uh, whites, I just sort of play with, we'll swing back and forth, we'll bring it to the right, we'll make things a little brighter. I start to lose my highlights again in the sky, but I sort of want to look and see, do I like what it's doing in the sand? Also got to be careful, watch this water up here. So I will bump my whites up just a little bit, like plus nine. And blacks, I'm going to use it and also bring the blacks up just a touch, because it helps get me a little bit more visibility into the cave recess area in there, and helps bring my foreground sand of the cave floor a little more, uh, less dark. It's still too dark, but better than it was. Now that I've got those taken care of, I will go take a quick look at contrast. And we swing it way far, obviously to the extreme. A lot of times with a slider, I'll swing it far and wide. Is it gonna have an effect and should I even play with it? Sometimes you'll slide a slider and you won't see a huge effect. And so you know you, you don't wanna spend too much time on you know going over micro adjustments. In this case, I will get a bit of an effect. But a lot of times I'll handle contrast in the tone curve. So I don't do a huge bump here. I think we'll go just with five. Yeah, I think I'll give it just a plus five on contrast. Uh, we can always come back to that later. That's the thing. If you don't like how something's going or you get further along the image and feel like a previous decision didn't work, you can go back up and retweak it based on some of those. Okay, then we get down to presence. Now we've got texture and clarity and dehaze. Clarity to me, I don't like to play with it too much because it starts to do, it brings in a lot of extra luminance to, luminance to the image. So what we're gonna do is just play a little bit. We'll, we'll kick it up. And the luminance isn't terrible here. Cause like I said, one of my problems I came into this image with was the darks over here and you know, sort of underexposed so I could keep those highlights. So let's just play a little bit. See, I like less luminance on the waterfall. I like the look it gives me there. I think I will do a slight clarity bump of plus five. Now texture should be a little more friendly and I am gonna bump it up to like plus 25. And a lot of what I'm trying to get out of texture is up here in these cave rocks, a little bit of the rocks around here and in here. I think texture is very friendly. It's a, been a cool new addition to Lightroom. I mean, it's been in it for what, a couple years now, right? I think it's a, a good way to bring out some of that detail without some of the, I guess, heavy handedness of clarity. Um, again, some of these topics we'll come back to in future videos and talk more specifically on texture versus clarity. I'm just trying to go through my basic workflow at the moment. I don't typically play a lot with saturation at this point in the image. I will use the HSL panel to do some saturation jobs and maybe a saturation over the image. And really, depending on the image, sometimes I do boost saturation just a little bit, and sometimes I bring it back just a little bit. It really sure depends how that closer to final image, but I don't make a global saturation adjustment at this point. I do sometimes, though, play with the vibrance a little bit. It's a little more friendly, less aggressive, and so I will give it just a little bump. I don't go too extreme on vibrance in most images. In um, this one, I'm just giving it a little kick. It helps give me a little bit of the color I want for it, give me a little bit of the brightness I'm looking for. So I just kicked it up plus five, and I sort of like the way that looks. Okay, so now we're gonna dive into uh, the tone curves. Come down in here, tone curve, and really for this point, what I do is it comes in default at linear. I am going to change it to medium contrast just to see what it does. Not 100% sure I even like that. So in this particular one, it really gave me just, I don't know, gave me too much contrast. So I'm actually gonna stick with linear on this. I might play with putting some points on here and just play a little bit with a little bit of an S curve here. And so what I'm trying to do is bring the highlights up. And I'm not sure I even like that. So let's, okay. So when I went back to the fall, I reversed those changes out. Let's see if I can just bring the blacks up a touch. So yeah, so I'm not finding a whole lot of contrast that I like. It's turning my image a little, um, 
I don't know. I don't even know the right word for it, but I don't, or I'm not really digging it. So what I have done is I just put a marker on the, the tone curve and I brought my blacks up just a teeny bit uh, just to give it a, that slightly better feel. And I think I like it this way. Again, th some of this is very subjective. Some people want more contrast in their image. Um, if you're going to play with contrast, I think the tone curve is a good place to do it. But I'm just not really liking how more contrast on this is working with this image. So I'm going to go sort of left it with the linear, kick my blacks up just a little bit, keep them from looking quite so digital, and we're, we're going to move on from there. Let's just take a quick look at our before and after. You can use the backslash key on your keyboard to see the before image and the after. It's very handy to do as you go through here. So let's take a look. This is currently what we've done, where we're at so far, and this is after we've worked with, you know, we did our lens corrections, did our calibration we made a quick fix to hsl to make up for that blue getting more saturated in the water went through the basic panel several things in the basic panel majority of them were small tweaks noticed a lot of them were small i didn't make huge changes in even the basic panel they're subtle tweaks on trying to get the image to where i want it to go play with the tone curve a bit thought i was going to add more contrast to it didn't really like the look with the contrast into it so we sort of backed that out and just brought those blacks up just a little bit um so let's take a look and see where we're at so this is the before image not quite as much color, a little more flat, you, you know, and then we brought it to this. Warmed it up, got a little more light in there. Things are already starting to even out. Like I said, these were my problem areas, and this was pretty dark. This was pretty bright. So I got those all pulled into line. I still think the contrast a little bit much because it's competing focus on trying to get eyes to the waterfall. So the way we're going to work on that is some, we'll start with some linear gradients. And what I'm going to do first is I'm going to bring one across from this side, uh, the upper right, the sky down towards the falls. And we're going to probably bring the exposure down just to touch on that, maybe bring the highlights down a bit more. And on the other side, we'll do almost the opposite. We'll bring a, a linear gradient up from the diagonal, from the cave floor up towards the falls. We'll bring the exposure up just a teeny bit, highlights up just a teeny bit, and, and see what that does. And it's a little bit of playing, see what looks good to your eye. So to get there, up here, the little circle, click that. We want a linear gradient. And we're just gonna bring it in from here, control my feather area, pull this guy in a little more like this. And I don't want him getting too much on that cave floor. So this linear gradient here is just coming right across here. We're gonna go ahead and get up to exposure. And we are going to just boost that just a little bit. I don't wanna go too crazy. So we're just gonna bring that down just a little bit. So we've got our linear gradient. As you can see, I'm just trying to cover this area up here. I got a little bit of the cave overhang in here. I should probably try to bring that out just a bit. Maybe move this back just a little. Because I don't want to get too much of this into the falls. The, the little top of the falls right up here, if it gets a little dimmer, it would actually be good because it's the most prone. So let's go ahead and bring the exposure down just a little bit. See, I like how that's coming already. Native 0 0.20. And let's bring the highlights down just a little bit more. Nice. And just bringing shadows and now shadows just doesn't help. Leave shadows alone and whites. Maybe pull the whites back. Pull whites back to a negative 12. Take a peek with this on. So here it is with the gradient off. Things are bright. Got some highlights. I'm blowing the highlights up in here. And let's bring that gradient back. And I just give it a little bit more. In fact, I may actually bring that exposure up just a teeny bit because it should be a little brighter. So I set that to negative 15. So cool. I think that's good for that one. I'm going to do a new linear gradient. This one we're going to bring up from this side. And this, I'm really focusing on this cave floor. It was just a little dark. I want it just to be just a touch brighter. To, again, trying to even the image out a little bit. About 32. I'll bring the highlights up a little. Pull the shadows up. And just to sort of even it out a little bit. Now, I'll sort of come back around and get the focus back on the falls. But that feels like a more balanced image to me right now. You still get the just You got the sky up here. And then you've got the the caves down here but so you've still got a little bit of that contrast so let's take a look so if you looked at the original image things were super dark down here very bright up here and now we sort of even that out a little bit uh, which gives me a little bit more liberty to figure out how I want to highlight the falls a little bit more and to help get the highlight on that falls we're going to add another this time we're going to do a radial gradient so a radial gradient we've got this little oval here I'm going to bring it into the center of the image it's almost like manually creating my vignette. I do vignette a little bit, a lot of my images. I'm always trying to draw the eye to what I want people to look at. And I want the falls to be the focus. People's eyes are drawn to the brightest part of the image. So I can sort of pull people's eyes towards that. It just makes people come into the image the way I want them to. So you sort of, your editing can help drive and direct some of that. So I think I like that. The gradient's pretty good. Like I said, what I wanted to do here was bring the exposure up. Just a teeny bit, that may have been too much because I do need to worry about those highlights up there. So really just sort of a 
just a slight bump off the highlights. Again, whenever you've got a waterfall where the water crests and the light is hitting it, you can, it's, that's the jerky spot to watch for highlights. So just wanna watch those highlights. I'm not blowing anything out, but I don't want them to look too crazy, too wonky. And then just because I want the falls to be a little smoother, I'm actually gonna just toss on a, a clarity and drop clarity by like, oh, this is one of those, we're gonna swing it and see what happens. See, you can make them real soft, crazy strong if you swing to the right. Now I just want to soften them up just a little bit, maybe like a negative 20, negative 15. I like that. We'll call that one done. And last little, I, so I'm sort of liking that. I've, I've got the falls looking pretty good. I got my light balance sort of more the way I wanted it to see. It was not quite as extreme while keeping the, the, the essence of the photo there. I think the other little thing I'm going to do with gradients is I'm going to come in here and just put another radial gradient in here and we will throw in radial gradient and just tweak that, try to get over the cave as much as I can. It's just gonna boost some of the texture on this cave wall. It can be a little interesting. So I got that, so now I'm gonna come down here to texture. I'm gonna boost that texture up a good chunk, like uh, 35, and we're gonna swing the clarity. See, see how clarity brightens that up and it makes it just very crisp and chunky. I'm not a big fan of that. I'm liking that texture. I think I'm just gonna boost that texture on that, and I think I'm gonna like that. So cool. So that gradient was just to bring a little bit of that texture into the, the, the cave walls and make sure that looked good. Last thing I want to do is we're just going to go in and look at the HSL panel. So this is where you can change hue, saturation, and luminance on color. So as opposed to a large global change of saturation, I can say, do I want these greens to pop a little more? And I can work on those. Or in this cave wall, do I want some of those oranges, yellows, grays to, to be a little more saturated or not? And again, it's a really personal preference. Some people want things a little more saturated, some a little less. Sometimes it's a certain image, something just starts to pop more than you wanted it to. So you can use this to make those micro adjustments to bring it down. It's a very powerful panel. If you know what color you want, you can come on in here and swing the, the slider. And sometimes that's a, a cool way to see. So like, let's say we take green, set to zero now, and do massive swings. Boom, trees all the way to the right, they get much, much green to the artificial side of the world and dim them out and they get much more, less piney. And really some might prefer this desaturated look. It does give it a nice forest-like feel. So I'm gonna just boost those greens just a touch. And I just did that manually. The other way to do this is if I click this, adjustment button up here and then I go move my pointer over point of green click and press up it'll boost the greens and yellows because Lightroom smart enough to figure out this is a combination of green and yellow so it can be a good way to make adjustments too in fact that's probably how I'm going to make these adjustments but I do want to boost the greens just a little bit I can watch my sliders over on the right I can watch them the yellow and green are going up about equal I think that's good we've already pulled blue down for the water so let's just do a quick turn HSL off HSL on off it's on so nothing hugely significant here i almost feel like i could bring this water down just a touch more let's go see if we can and this is just saturation at the moment i'm gonna play with the blue just bring it down just a touch more again i like my water to be more on the white side than this weird artificial blue and the only other little piece i sort of want to see is if i can bring out more saturation and contrast or color over here in these brick in these walls there's lots of little oranges and yellows and rust reds that run through it so, you know, we'll click a little button. We'll come over here. This part looks like it's got some interesting colors. So I'm looking for a part that's got colors in it. And if I boost that, you know, make big swings. I mean, it's changing the walls and the sand in the foreground. A little bit of a boost. Well, let's do a small boost just to give a little bit of punch. These are all subtle changes if you do it right. It's really, again, very subjective. And you just really have to, you know, take a look at your image and what field you want it to have. I didn't make any huge significant changes. The blue saturation is the biggest one I changed. A lot of that was to counteract from when the calibration, when I kicked it way up. I didn't like the direction my water went, so I used the HSL to bring that down. You can play with hue and luminance in this image. You know, hue, you can shift the colors to be slightly different. So if you had a particular vision in mind or you wanted your leaves more yellow or, or, or things like that, you can use the hue to sort of make those shifts, which can be interesting. And luminance, if you needed to get some brightness in a certain area, for example, if I wanted to get more brightness in those trees, I can come over and bring the green under luminance up and it's gonna bring the areas that are color green brighter. So a great real tool if you have a particular area or image that's dim and you want to target it by color, you can do that. Again, the little clicker works to click on that object and it'll change the values that need change. I tend to hang out in saturation a lot, hue and luminance sometimes. Again, we'll dive into the HSL panel in more detail in a future video. But for this basic workflow, this is where I tend to spend most of my time.
And at this point, this is where I get to the point where I just sort of take a look and see what do I like, what don't I like. Uh, we'll use the backspace or backslash key to take a look at the before image. So this is my before image. Like I said, my problems were the, in my opinion, the, the problems were the super bright sky, super dark shadows in here, waterfalls exposed. My exposure was good, but I needed to tweak it to get it to really show what I wanted to show. So bring that back. So to me, I did warm it up because to me, this is more of the feel of this cave is the way the sand is colored, the way the cave walls. So I needed to bring that warmth up. Again, white balance is, you know, there is some subjectiveness to it. So, you know, go with what pleases your eye and your vision and the story you want to tell. I think I got things balanced out more. I don't have anything hiding in the shadows. I'm liking my water. You know, I think I'm pretty happy with this. So after that review, I am going to pop in. Sometimes I will play with the color grading and, you know, how my highlights and shadows are colored. I don't do this all the time, and I don't always leave it in my photo, but sometimes it's worth taking a look at. So we pop in the color grading. We've got our midtones, our highlights, our shadows. I'm going to come over to our highlights, and I'm just going to use one of the canned colors. That makes it just a touch too warm to me. That one's not bad. These are just sort of some of the canned, and canned colors. And what it's doing is it's taking the highlights and giving them a slightly different tone. And you can move them all over the wheel here and go any direction you want. It's real easy to make an image look goofy. I think I like that with the uh, just a slight change to the highlights. Can make them again just a touch warmer across the highlights. I think that works good. And shadows. So I don't mess with the shadows because in this particular case because that makes it too warm in my opinion. And throw them blue in and that's to me where it starts to get just a little goofy. And cooling those shadows down a little bit gives me a reasonable little effect. So let's take a look. So I am going to cool those shadows down just a little bit. So what I'm doing is I'm sort of warming my highlights and cooling my shadows to sort of bring everything all in together from the color grading panel. I don't get crazy in the color grading panel, but they've made it really easy to do some basic color grading corrections. So it can be a fun place to play and it can be a cool place to pick up your style or add to your style. With that, you know, I think things look good. The review looks good. I'm going to come down in the detail section and we're going to play with sharpening first. Don't do a ton of changes here. I will probably kick my detail up just a little bit to like 30, bring my amount up to like 45, and it's not bad. One thing we're doing sharpening is good to look closely at the image. So in Lightroom, there's this little exclamation point, click in, and it zooms you into 100%. It's good if you're doing your sharpening adjustments to be looking at the image at 100% and not like fit or you know fill or anything like that in Lightroom. Be wary of over sharpening an image or it can make things look a little wonky. Personal taste, a lot of experimentation. In my opinion, smaller adjustments are better than overly large adjustments. So I, you know, I bumped the sharpening up just a little bit. We're gonna go ahead and play with moving it up just a little more. So for this image, because I really want those cave pieces to be nice and sharp, I'm going to kick it to 50. I'm leaving my radius as is. I'd kick my detail up a little bit. Now this is where it really gets big, is your masking. So masking is what areas of the image are going to get this sharpening applied. Sharpening, you tend to want it to be applied to those edges, those lines of detail, those points of contrast. So by default, Lightroom is going to apply it to the whole image. That means it's going to apply it to my water. It's going to apply it if I had more sky in here. It's going to apply it to my clouds. You know, all that. When really, I just want to bring it in on the parts that should be sharpened. So the masking tool is great for that. If you hold down the Option key on the Mac and press this masking button, you can see white is going to apply to everything. If I slide the mask over, we're going to bring the fit back. This is where I do bring the fit back because I want to see what I'm trying to do is mask it so my water is not getting a ton of it but my edges and stuff are so let's see what that does so that masking i hold the option key slide that mask and what it's doing is the items that start to turn black are not getting the sharpening so i was trying to get my water to not get as much of that sharpening whereas i want my cave ridges and things like that to get the sharpening so that mask is very it might be very important i wouldn't necessarily just go with what default lightroom says and apply it to the whole image use it to tweak it a little bit in this particular case i was able to you know bring the mask back you know, my sand in the foreground is getting it, my trees in there, a good chunk of the textury, textury pieces of the image are, are getting it. So let's zoom in 100% over here. I like that. The water is not overly crispy, so I like that. Take it back to fit. I think that looks pretty good. Noise reduction really depends on the image. With this, with so much shadow and how much I had to bring up, we are just going to bring up noise reduction just a little bit, about 20. Got to be a little bit careful with noise reduction because it can... Do weird things in the image, you don't go crazy. It's better to get a as noise-free as image as possible. Trying to fix it with noise reduction isn't necessarily gonna get you a great quality image, but let's take a quick peek at that. Yeah, I like that. I think that's good. Okay, and really this image is just about to where I want it. Last thing I would do in Lightroom, 
would be underneath effects. I do like to play with vignetting. Again, I'm always trying to bring my viewer's eye to what I want them to see. And so a lot of times, just, just a slight darkening. You don't want to go extreme or it looks sort of corny, but a subtle, like you don't want someone to look at your image and go, that's vignetted. But if they can't tell and it's darken the edges a little bit to help bring them into the center of the frame or into the frame where you want to be, it can be very helpful. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go into the effects panel, put some vignetting in, so like I said, extreme, obviously you don't want vignetting like this. That looks weird. Even that's too much at negative 31. So usually what I'll end up, if I end up with a vignette, I will be in between the five and the 10 mark. So what I'm looking at here is I'm toggling it off and on. I've done a lot of work to try to balance this out and get it already in. I did that, if you remember, I did the radial filter over the falls here, which is sort of acting like a vignette. So in this case, I don't need to do a lot of vignetting on this image. I've sort of done it already through my linear gradients to sort of balance the light across the image, as well as my radial filter that I did over the waterfall itself to sort of bring it up. So I've already sort of done my own manual vignette, but I do want to play here. I just kicked a negative three, which hardly any difference at all but I actually think that's what I want because look as you turn it on you can see right up here in these corners watch these corners when I go back and forth I'm gonna turn it off on and see how the corners is ever so subtly it gets a touch darker to me that's not too much again that's negative three that is hardly any difference at all so vignetting sometimes you may not need to do it you may not prefer it I tend to like it and put it in but I'd already in this case where I probably normally would be more of a negative five negative ten vignetting in a lot of images because I've done so much work with the radio filter and the linear gradients, I had already sort of manually created my vignette. And that's it. So let's take a look at the before and after. There's the before, you know, well exposed image. And this is one of the things I preach. The key to good landscape photography, in my opinion, is get a well exposed image. Um, now, when those come straight out of camera, sometimes they look a little funky because this is a well exposed image. And, you know, I didn't lose a ton of detail and highlights, but I got some dark pieces over here. So it doesn't really completely reflect what the human eye saw. But with, you know, moving it on into edits, I had a lot of liberty to work with my image and to pull out what I wanted, dim down what I didn't. So I had all the data I really needed to move. And that's where I think when you learn to get that well-exposed image to your editing platform, you have just so much leverage to pull out what you saw and the story you want to tell. And like I said, I mentioned I do sometimes think, bring things into Photoshop. In this particular image, there's not a ton of what I bring into Photoshop, but what I really like Photoshop for is it's cloning and healing brushes. Lightroom just has not caught up. I'm convinced Adobe does that because they want you to have Photoshop as well. Uh, they've gotten a little better over the years, but it's just so much more efficient and less frustrating for me to do it in Photoshop. In this particular image, if I was to take it into Photoshop and clean anything up, this little bright white piece of snow here, it's just distracting, doesn't need to be there. Similar with the one over here, I'd probably clean that up. These, it was winter time, I don't mind those much, but the ones that are sort of outliers that, that get in my way, this little spot over here. So there's a couple spots I might take this into Photoshop for to clean up, you know, from that standpoint. And that's really about it. You know, image cleanups I take in there. But that's it. Like I said, this image I would say is 95% done. To some, it'd probably be considered done and complete. Like I said, I would put this on social media without much problem. I'd probably do that extra cleanup before it hit portfolio. But yeah, that's Lightroom. That's my basic Lightroom editing workflow. So I hope you found this video useful. Like I said, uh, I've become convinced that editing processes change over time and, and frequently. Uh, that's one of the reasons I put off from doing this video because I felt like my editing process was never, well, I, it's not consistent. It's not always there. And I think over time I've realized it just continues to change as I learn more and as my style changes. So it was time to put this video out. Like I said, I think the at least the basic workflow would get someone in the right direction of what they could be tweaking, what they could be working with. And it sort of gives you that foundation to work from. You'll learn more your style will change and you'll change things different. You'll stop visiting certain sections. You'll use more saturation, less saturation. You know, you'll like vignette, not like vignette. Um, that stuff will all change over time. So again, I think if I remake this video in six months, it would look a little different than it does today. But I thought it was important to get out there and sort of let people see because it's a topic I've not covered very greatly on this YouTube channel. So in future videos, I'll probably dive into certain sections a little more, you know, a little bit more about specifically what they do. Today was more of an overview of my workflow as opposed to a detailed dive into each section, but hopefully you found that helpful. And if you like today's video, be sure to hit that like button. And if you want to see future landscape photography content from me in the future, including tips, tricks, gear reviews, and behind the scenes, please hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any landscape photography content from me. And thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.